The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, September 29th, 2013. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And now with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday online fellowship question and answer. And today we're going to um, open up the room in just a second to receive your questions or your comments. And each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind at this time. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible. And the Bible is the place we want to turn to in order to find our answers if God is pleased to uh, to give us understanding and and we're living in a time when he he is opening up many things in his word to the understanding of his people so that is an encouragement to us as we uh, study the word of God as we search for answers to to questions of the mysteries of the gospel of God's kingdom he encourages us to go to him and to pray for wisdom and to to study to search the scriptures and and uh, and oftentimes we do come to uh, the correct understanding of what the Lord is teaching well we We'll open up the room now at this time, and we're going to go to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Hello. Can you turn to Luke 21? Luke 21. Verses uh, 22, I guess, to 25. Okay. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. I'm looking at the language where it says, but woe to them that are with child um, and, and to them that give suck in those days. And, uh, you know, people are asking, does this apply to the day, to the, to the time when the door is closed? In one sense, it does. And in other senses, it points back to the Great Tribulation. So it's kind of hard to to say it, it, it applies to one and not the other, or, or uh, but it, it, it well, looks like it applies to this day because of all this language that we have here. Yeah, well, well, uh, it it looks like it fits, and, and uh, it looks like it fits very well because it's the same cup. And but when God is making this kind of statement in the context of Luke twenty one, um, verse twenty four tells us that it has to do with the judgment on the churches because it refers to Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles or the nations until until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And over in Matthew 24, where um, that similar verse is found in verse 19, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation. So it's set in the context of the great tribulation, and it, it really, it's the same judgment, because it's the same cup first given to the city called by the Lord's name, and then the, the identical cup is given to the nations of the world. It's significant, or, well, maybe that's not the right word, but it's uh, amazing that there are people who had no problem proclaiming God's judgment on the churches. 
they they believe it they understand it they said the holy spirit left there's no salvation and whether they they thought it through or not what the bible is teaching and what they were saying is that god left and abandoned about 2 billion people and many of those people were in families families go to churches uh, husbands and wives and children and many children were born in the congregations they that is their their family was in the church at the time they were born and they stayed there their whole life and they could have been born at any point within that 23 year great tribulation period and while they were in the congregation there there was no possibility that they could have become saved. It's only if God mercifully and graciously drew them away from the church, and then they could have been saved. And that means that there are millions of children that were born into the churches, and and while they were born into the churches and remained there, there was no possibility that any of them could have been saved. And uh, now the people who had no problem with that previously, now their, their problem is with the idea that judgment is on all the world and God has done the same thing to the nations. As he says in Jeremiah 25, um, the Lord points out, if I've done this to the people called by my name, shall ye, referring to the nations, be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be utterly unpunished. God will do the same thing to the world. As a matter of yeah. fact, the the churches had a relationship with God. The, the people outside of the churches have no relationship. If God did it to those in which he had an intimate relationship, it, as Christ purchased and bought the congregations and established them, then what makes anyone think he wouldn't do this at least the same thing to the inhabitants of the earth in which he does not even have that kind of relationship. It, it, what's really happened is that these people who, who are outside of the church, you, you see that judgment on the churches didn't touch them. It didn't touch them in, in the same way it did the people within the church. But now God has brought the judgment right to their doorstep, right to their house, and, and they don't like it. And they are responding in an almost identical way to the people, uh, some of the people that were in the churches responded when they heard about the end of the church age and, and God wasn't saving in the churches. Oh, that's heresy. Oh, that uh, you're, you're blaspheming. You're speaking against the church of Christ. And and they uh, very uh, angry, very negative reaction because uh, they realized what was being said, and and they they just dismissed it and and they wrote it off. Now, um, some people outside of the church, it's come to them. Excuse me, it's come to them where they live, and they don't like it a bit. And, and God has brought the judgment right to their doorstep, and, and now they're, they're basically conducting themselves as those in the churches conducted themselves. They're not humbling themselves before the Word of God. They're being very proud. They're saying such, uh, such a thing cannot happen. Uh, God would never do such a thing. It, it, it's, it's amazingly similar response because it is the same cup yeah i under, oh, and i thank you for that and we and we ha, we do understand that we we've, we've uh, discussed that all before but i wanted to take the conversation in a little bit different direction and and that is to look at the specific language in luke 21:24 it says until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled and when we look at that language the times of the gentiles we it, from my understanding, it's, it's talking about the time when sin has its reign, when, when, when pride is at its highest, okay, which we are actually in right now because since May 21, it looked like our prophecy had failed. Therefore, 
uh, the, the, this, that gives the unsaved the authority. They think they have the authority now that, that oh, the Bible is, you can't trust it, and you people don't understand the Bible, so now they are, this is the time of the Gentiles we're in right oh, now. No, no, that, that's not what that verse is referring to, because, uh, again, let's read Luke 21, 24. Um, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Now, who is Jerusalem? That, that's a reference to the churches, until right. the time until- for the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, if we compare that with Revelation 11, and it says in Revelation 11 in verse 2, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, For it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And that forty and two months figure is representative of the entire 23-year Great Tribulation period. So that's the, the times of the Gentiles. It's the duration of the Great Tribulation. It's not in these days after the Great Tribulation. This isn't the time of the Gentiles. They've been defeated. The nations no, it, of the world are conquered. It, okay. It, in a sense, it is the time of the, it's still the time of the Gentiles, because it's the Gentiles came in to destroy the court, and the Gentiles are still uh, destroying, trying to destroy the the truth. And what they're doing is they're killing each other. So in in that sense, it's it's still the time of the Gentiles because they're still like raging waves. They're, they're they think they have the authority with their lies, and and what that what that time. See, I'm looking at that language as picking out two two different time frames, both both the tribulation and the continuation into Judgment Day, where it's the same cup. So it's the same the same thing. How did the, how did the churches how were they destroyed? Because they, Satan came in, the, the the lies and the false gospels came in, and and now that they they they're holding what they hold is not true, and now the same thing that same cup is being given to the world. The world is now swallowing down the, the lies, that, that, uh, and that's what's killing them. It's because they have forsaken the Word of God. They, that they're well, now they're well, well God is killing them. God is killing them. God killed them when he shut the door to heaven, when he uh, guaranteed— the, when we look the, at— Excuse me, look he, at guaran- he, guaranteed, 20. he guaranteed their destruction when he shut the door to heaven, when he put out the light of the gospel— you know, God is the one doing this. He's the one that has brought the battle of Judgment Day to Satan and his kingdom, typified by Babylon, and conquered them. We we have to look at that 70-year historical example. When the Medes and the Persians come to Babylon, they they take it in that very night, and the king of Babylon becomes Cyrus. He takes over the kingdom, and the the previous king of Babylon is slain, and and now the Medes and Persians rule the kingdom. This is a time of great victory. This is a time where the kingdom of heaven, where Christ has been exalted to rule the nations, and and he's ruling them with a rod of iron, but he's ruling them, and uh, the no, the, it's not fitting. What the verse um, yeah, in yeah. Luke twenty one twenty four, it, it's it's in the context of the judgment on the churches, and then verse twenty five. Remember, it doesn't say it here, but when you read about the sun, moon, and stars in Matthew twenty four, if you look at the context there, you'll read again the verse: "Woe unto them that give suck," is before the darkening of the sun. And then immediately after the tribulation, the sun is darkened. And this verse from verse 24, that's the judgment on the church. Verse 25 begins the judgment on the world. And uh, we have to take into consideration the other passages too. Can we just close with one verse? Uh, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 23. 2 Chronicles 20, 23 says, For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another.
Yeah, and this 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 is a uh, this is in the language of Jehoshaphat and the Valley of Decision, which is being connected to uh, all the end time language of Judgment Day today that, that you're studying in Jeremiah and uh, um, these many of the, even last week's study as well. No, when when I'm done, Grace. And so anyway, so uh, and and also when we look up, we see that uh, Jerusalem was said to stand ye still. This battle is not yours, but the Lord's. So. The, the, oh, yes. the, the, the war that's going on, the war that's going on, I believe the war that's going on in our day right today is is identical to the battle of, of this verse in Second Chronicles chapter 20, and that the world out there today is destroying one another, and, and that's what's happening. We're standing there, and this is the judgment, and the judgment is that because you have forsaken me and my words, I will forsake you. And that's what's happening now. We're watching as the world is being forsaken of God. And when that occurs, what happens to man when that occurs? And we're seeing it. They fall into sin, and they fall into lies, and they believe, you know, anything that they want. And, and that's the judgment. And we're watching the judgment. So, so anyways, that's, that's how I'm understanding it. And that's how All I right. make those other verses. Okay, but thank All you. Right. All right. Well, thank you for... Uh, bringing up those verses in your in your comments now, uh, it, it's true. You know this is this is Judgment Day, and God comes with ten thousands of His saints. But we're not fighting anybody. We're we're not doing anything except uh, learning from the Bible and sharing what we learn. And and God is using the fact that He saved all the elect to shut the door, and He's allowing the nations to to multiply sin, to continue to do that, and that is a, a, a one aspect of the judgment upon them. Well, thank you. And let's let's go to a question from Pal Talk. The question is, is it a sin to joke? Is it a sin to joke? Well, um, let's take a look at, I think it's in Ephesians. In Ephesians... Um, chapter 5, where it says in verse uh, 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now here, God is referring to foolish talking and uh, foolish talking really uh, that's a wide spectrum of, of things that uh, we, once we consider that someone can uh, speak of something in a very scientific way, of course they're not using uh, true science. It, it's prejudice science because of their uh, inner tendency to, to desperately want there to be no God, and and they speak of evolution, and they they speak uh, that there is no God. Well, that's foolish talking. The the fool has said in his heart there is no God, and then it goes on to say jesting, and I I believe that uh, this is referring to foolish jesting, and there is foolish jesting, and then there's jesting. Uh, and which we have to be very careful with always that is done in, in good nature. And, and uh, I, I think there is a place um, amongst friends for lighthearted joking. And I, I don't think God has any problem with that. But if it becomes foolish jesting, where we're making fun of things we should not make fun of. And there's a long list of, of that. We, we should never joke about God. We should never make jokes about the Word of God. And, and there's also a proper time and in, in place for these kinds of things. When we're, we're before others and, and we're witnessing the gospel, that's probably not a good time to... Uh, make a jest, and yet if we're alone with friends, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Again, as long as uh, all the other guidelines that concern what we say are in place and we're not 
being cruel. Where, um, yeah, let, let me just give an example. Let's say there is a husband and wife, and they've been together a long time, and they know each other very well, and they learn to joke or jest with each other about certain things that they know will not um, cause the other person uh, any any harm. It will not cause the other person to to react in a negative way. It, it's just something that they have learn to do together that they enjoy and it doesn't hurt either person. Um, it's, it's a part of their relationship and, uh, I don't think there's any problem with that at all. Uh, but thank you for that question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, brother Kish. Um, I thank my Lord first and foremost that we are gathered here again on the Sabbath day. Um, What I'd like to talk about is 2 Kings, the last chapter, 25, 2 Kings 25, starting from verse 27 on to 30, and how that, um, you know, when you are obedient, whether you're saved or not, you know, the blessings of the Lord come upon you. And this is what happened to one of the kings um, after the captivity. Okay, let, let me read this passage, Second Kings 25, beginning in verse 27. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month on the seven and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of prison, and he spake kindly to him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments, and he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day all the days of his life. And so you're pointing to this as an example of Jehoiachin. um, uh, Wasn't he one of the, yes. He, he was he was a king of Judah. Kings. No, no, Jehoiachin was an evil king. He, but didn't he, was he go one, to captivity when he was told to go into captivity? Well, um, uh, let's see the 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 those last kings of Judah. They were all wicked kings, and and God doesn't say of any of them that they did right or anything like that. That's normally the indicator when a king. Uh, is is um, uh, probably a, a, a child of God. They would do right in the sight of the Lord. And none of those last kings of Judah were good kings. They're kings that represent the church at the end uh, during the, the Great Tribulation period. And even here, it, notice it's the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, and he went into captivity in 598. So, so um, the Lord is letting us know this is the year 561 BC. But the number 37 is a number that um, identifies with judgment. And and so, in the 37th year of his captivity, that is, he's still under the judgment of God. Then the king of Babylon, evil Merodach lifts up his head, and and yes, they have now a good relationship. He's speaking kindly to him. And notice that um, it is the king of Babylon that is providing his bread. The king of Babylon, this is still during the 70-year period, would be a picture of Satan. And it is really giving us the spiritual picture that Satan, as he rules over the churches during the 23-year Great Tribulation period, is the one that provides the bread, the gospel, for those in the churches and congregations. So, you know, uh, we don't know historically. uh, Maybe King Jehoiachin was conducting himself well as a prisoner, and maybe this is how things developed, and, and he made a friend. But spiritually, it's pointing to um, God's wrath 
upon the churches and the churches submitting not to God. God isn't the one that provided the daily bread, but to um, Satan, the king of Babylon, as he's typified by the king of Babylon. Um, thank you, Chris. That really helped me a lot. Um, and uh, God bless e Bible. Well, thank you for bringing up this passage and for your comments. And let's go to another question from uh, Pal Talk. Uh, these questions, can you please read Matthew 6, 3? What does left hand and right hand spiritually refer to? And what does the giving of alms spiritually refer to? Matthew 6, 3. Um, let, let's begin reading in verse 1 because it, it, it begins speaking of alms there. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And alms were acts of mercy. It could be um, for a Jew to, uh, to give a little money to maybe a beggar on the street, or it could be that they, they gave the money to the temple, um, it, it, it is some sort of act of mercy. Now, by it, God has in view the sharing of the gospel uh, during especially the time of the day of salvation because, well, uh, there, were, there were people out there that had to hear. They were God's elect. They were not yet saved. They must hear in order to become saved. And, and so God's people basically shared alms as we went forth with the gospel. And, uh, you know, God is indicating here, don't make a big deal out of it. And also there are some uh, that use their, their money. They, they provided financial support. Maybe they, they paid or, or supported a person's trip overseas, and that person handed out 5,000 tracts. And or or whatever, maybe they sent the money to a ministry, and the ministry was able to share the the Bible message far and wide. Okay, now if you did a good deed, if you performed an alm, you you did an act of mercy, as God commands us. You know, it's basically our duty. We're we're not doing anything special. We're not doing anything above what we're commanded to do. It was our duty to send forth the gospel that people become saved. And presently, it is our duty to send forth the gospel that those that are saved may hear. Uh, now, now uh, just keep that to yourself between you and God. There's no need, uh, for instance, to uh, for, for a man to say, you know, uh, I went on so many track trips and, and I handed out so many tracks and, and, and basically God says, no, that that's nothing to brag about. It's nothing to boast of it. That just leads to pride and you no, know, be humble, be humble. And, uh, just, just do these things is so that if it were possible that your right hand would not know what your left hand were doing. That, that's how secretive it should be. But thank you. No, but let me just say one thing. You know, sometimes it's necessary and good for us to give reports. And that's a different matter. And, and especially normally people are asked to do this. And, and so um, someone who leads a trip or someone that goes on a trip may be requested to give a report of a track trip. And, and that's something different. They're, they're just trying to let those that did sponsor them know about it, what happened, and also to encourage others maybe to go on future trips. 
but that that's not what God's saying here. It's about an individual who's very proud of himself for the alms that he's done. But thank you for that question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chris, for your study. It was really good. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I was wondering if you might turn to Numbers chapter 15, verses 26 and 27 regarding sins done in ignorance. Mm-hmm. Numbers and, 15, yes. Yes, uh, chapter 15 and verses 26 and 27. Okay, I'll, I'll read that, and then you can you can ask your question or make your comment. It shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. Right. My question... Um, my question about ignorance and sitting in, in your study today was uh, kind of tied into what I remember from Ezekiel 14, verse 14. Oh, uh, you want me to read that, Ezekiel? Yes, please. Mm-hmm. Ezekiel 14, 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord Jehovah. Right. And uh, so we've learned that uh, when Christ saved his elect from May 21st on, and that we're gold, silver, and precious stones here, that even though the land has that, or the the unsaved have them among them, they are not saved by presence. Um, And I was looking at this verse in Numbers about ignorance, to say that some people who are still probably uh, following a false gospel of works are s- suggesting that, well, because they're ignorant of that, that God would overlook that. And therefore, um, you know, uh, I, my question is, well, what is ignorance really applied to if it's not the Word of God and doing the will of God? Uh, how, well, how does uh, that apply I, to our lesson uh, I, today? I, I, know, I'm trying I, to ask. I know what you're asking, I think, because I've looked up um, that word ignorance, and and it, it's really incredible in a couple of verses. It almost sounds as if because someone's ignorant that God saved them. Or And actually, in 1 Timothy, we read of the Apostle Paul um, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 12, where it says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And you see how that almost sounds as if uh, they be due to the sin uh, being done in ignorance that this led to Saul of Tarsus receiving the mercy of God. And that's not what it's saying, because there's a great many sinners that sin ignorantly, and they're they're not saved, and they never became saved. But ignorance, it, it, let's, let's just contrast that with willful disobedience. Willful disobedience, it would be the opposite of ignorance, and there does come periods of time in which there is willful disobedience. In Hebrews chapter 10, as the Lord uh, it really is referring to the time of the end, beginning with a great tribulation, and he encourages uh, in verse 25 to, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, that is, between the individual and God, And then it says in verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And that would relate to earlier in Hebrews. In Hebrews 6, remember as God says in verse 6, If they shall fall away to renew them again, 
Well, uh, I would have to read from verse 4 where it says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. The, this has to do with the time when God opened up the Scripture and the information that God brought forth was willfully, intentionally resisted by those in the churches. Now, God drew his people out, but there was willful disobedience, and none that, that sinned willfully within the churches found repentance or salvation because God ended the church age and he wasn't saving anyone within those congregations. And, but, but outside of the church, in a world, yes, full of Muslims and Buddhists and and Hindus, and, um, and atheists, in a world of people that are also sinning, but doing so ignorantly because they do not have the Word of God. They, they're not in the church. God saved a great multitude. And uh, really, when we read that um, something like this, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly, it just means that he was qualified to become saved, that, that uh, he was not in willful disobedience or, or, or in a, a time and place when, when God was accounting that sort of thing as he did uh, at the point of the end of the church age. It was, it was a very important time for people to hearken to the word of God but anyone who would sin ignorantly, they're sinning, and, and, and ignorance is no excuse. It's still rebellion against God, yet they are qualified to possibly um, experience the grace of God if God bestows it upon them. And, and yet, um, on the other hand, those in the churches and congregations are not sinning ignorantly, but willfully. And there is no possibility of salvation uh, within the church. Well, that, that makes sense and clarifies what I, what I thought of. Also, the stranger among them, that sounds like somebody who hasn't been saved as of yet, but they, uh, they will be. In other words, their sins, they may have been sinning like Paul was when he was Saul, but then after he was saved, he was not a stranger anymore. So... Um, I, I have one more question, if you if I have time, and that's okay. to look at First Kings, <laughs> verse, uh, uh, chapter seven, verse one, compared with this verse just before it, uh, chapter six, verse thirty-eight. And I was wondering about the significance of the number thirteen and the and uh, the house of Solomon. Why he? What, why is the Lord p putting the temple of the Lord in the house of Solomon? And what's thirteen having to? to tie oh, in with the end of the world. Uh, okay. Because um, he spends uh, 11 verses describing that house, and, mm -hmm. it's, and it, it just it, seems it's, like it's a well, church it's, it's a it's a different picture, uh, but it's pointing to the same thing. In 1 Kings 7, you're right, in the previous verse, it, it refers to the house of God is finished in the 11th year, and then 1 Kings 7, verse 1, but Solomon was building his own house, 13 years, and he finished all his house. And here Solomon, whose name means peace, um, and is building a house, and, and that would point to Christ building the house of God. It, it's a, another figure, a different figure, a different spiritual picture, and yet it, it ends up um, in the same way, pointing to the end of the world is the number 13 identifies with the end of time after 13,000 years of history. And then Christ completed his house um, that he was building. As it says in Hebrews chapter 3, it, it, it refers to Christ being over his house. Whose house are we? And, and so it, it would point to um, just like the house of God um, points to the true believer, so does Solomon's house. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, and God bless you, Bible Fellowship. Well, thank you for... Sheep. All right. 
thank you for um, those verses and your question and comments. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program today. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Please go ahead. Okay, I have uh, two questions. They're, they're probably pretty quick. Um, the first one is, uh, before I forget, with regard to your answer that you just gave regarding ignorance and willful disobedience, could it then be said that since May 21, 2011, that everything, all sin, it, there, there, there is no more ignorance. It's all willful disobedience. Well, you, you know, um, um, God did broadcast the message of Judgment Day to the world, and um, and so the the world that uh, previously was ignorant of time and judgment, well, they received a message from God from the Bible concerning time and judgment, and and so yes, it's possible, it, it's possible that. God um, is, now considers the world to uh, to not lie in ignorance uh, as they did before. Um, that that's possible. Yeah, because it's a, it's a spiritual condition, from what I gather that you were saying. Yeah, it's. Um, it, I mean, the Apostle Paul says he was a blasphemer, and even in that verse where he speaks of of uh, finding mercy due to his ignorance. And, and, and the blasphemer is someone who speaks evil of, and uh, in this case, he was speaking evil of Christ and evil of the Christian way. And, and of course, Christ is God, and the Christian way is the way of God. And, and even though he was a blasphemer, he compelled men and women to, to blaspheme themselves, and he did many evil things. Uh, as Saul of Tarsus, he he cast them into prison, and some were killed. And uh, when Stephen, the martyr of the Lord, was killed, Saul was consenting unto his death, standing by. And yet, it, it was at a time where God was not reckoning these things, or or the time in history was the beginning of the church age, the early years of the church age. And it was not a point such as the end of the church age when God was opening scriptures and, and it was um, uh, very important uh, concerning the direction that the church take. And so uh, God was just saving individuals who, who were not willfully disobeying the things that he was opening up from his word. I, I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I think it's, it makes a lot of biblical sense as to the explanation of the word ignorant, um, that we, you know, instead of looking at it physically, we look at it spiritually. My other question is on the new, on the, on the track that has the square barcode, where, where is that supposed to take somebody if they scan it? <laughs> Well, um, Bill Burton would probably be better to answer that. From what I understand, that puts the track on someone's phone. Um, if they take the track and they scan that QR code, then it will put the track on their phone, or it takes them to a website that Bill has set up. And, and then they can share that track with with anyone they wouldn't need the paper anymore and and that's why um i think bill also had an idea of printing out the qr code on a large piece of paper and then um sort of um fastening it to yourself maybe on your back or on your arm somewhere and and then people could actually walk by you with their phone and scan you and they would need to even take the physical physical tracks. Okay, uh, Bill just wrote me. He says it takes them to the same track on the website. So so it would take them to the website where they could read the track. Um, and well, it, it conserves paper. Um, in today's world, people 
love that idea. Actually, you know, this could have been helpful when we were on a track trip to Dublin in Ireland in early 2011. We were asked to leave the city because of litter and people were taking the track and throwing it on the ground and the authorities didn't like that and they requested we leave the city. Now, it could be more reason than the litter that they wanted us out of the city, but but maybe if we had had something like this at that time, we could have still gone and stood on street corners paperless and <laughs> just hold up a sign. Uh, May 21, 2011, Judgment Day, scan here. <laughs> but um, the, 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 the idea, I think, is very good. There are many yeah. people, many people um, in the world, that even in the poorest of countries, they have phones. They don't have computers, and, and they don't have a lot of things, but they have phones. And, and uh, something like this um, is excellent to try and reach those people. When it takes you to the track on the, on the uh, website, can you then navigate from there to, uh, like, the homepage of uh, eBibleFellowship.com or eBible2? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Bill, Bill is texting me or writing me, and he said each track trip could have a unique QR code so you can trace where it was received. And, and um, I think that would mean if we went on a track trip to Brazil, um, we handed out tracks and people scan that particular QR code, we would probably have some kind of indicator how many people went to the website and and uh, oh, Bill says it's the actual website so they will they will be able to, to go anywhere on the website okay thank you all right well thank you for uh, those questions and let's see we have another question from pal talk uh, Christy writes please read Isaiah 2620 and Isaiah 10. 24 and 25 could these passages be related that one speaks about the indignation beginning and the other speaks of the indignation ceasing let's read isaiah 26 20 it says come my people enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed and then isaiah 10, 24, and 25 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord Jehovah of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt for yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. Well, uh, I haven't really looked too closely at Isaiah chapter 10, but uh, we can know that the Assyrian is really an, another picture of um, the kingdom of Satan because the Assyrians destroyed Israel in the north <clears throat> and, and the king of Assyria. And and uh, and um, as the Babylonians and the king of Babylon destroyed Judah in the south, and the destruction of Israel in the north is a picture of the judgment on the churches, and this uh, this could uh, therefore look at the indignation, the wrath of God that began on the house of God, and and that's when it really began, and. And uh, then there comes a point where God ushers all of his people into the safe chamber of salvation. That's where uh, we are to hide ourselves, as it says in Isaiah 26, 20, hide thyself as it were for a little moment. And when we search the, the Bible to, to find out what does God mean by hide ourselves, we find in Colossians um, chapter 3, in verse 3, that it says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And, and that is speaking of salvation. 
and and this is what God was uh, beckoning people to do. Seek ye the Lord, as he said in Zephaniah chapter 2, in the early for a few verses of that chapter. Seek ye the Lord, that you may be hid in the day of Jehovah's anger. And, and so God sent forth his word into all the world and called and beckoned to sinners, seek me. Perhaps you might be hid. That is, find salvation. And once saved, it's immediately the, the picture of entering into the ark. That was safety from the flood. There, there was security it, it, as that ark typified Christ and salvation. And leading up to May 21, 2011, God sent forth his word. He did find every child that that he intended to find each one of his elect and everyone entered into these chambers and the doors were shut about them, protecting them just like God shut the door in the ark. And it's only for a little moment as uh, when we follow that phrase, a little moment, it identifies with the entire period of judgment day. And, and then at the end of this period of judgment day, which will probably continue for 1,600 days. The indignation, the wrath of God, is overpassed. Uh, the, the, so, yes, the, the uh, indignation being overpassed points to the end of the day of judgment. But thank you for those verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer time. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Uh... You can hear me okay, right? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you for your call. Um, I'm uh, under definitely the impression that we're at the end of the world, and I believe that uh, judgment began on the house of God in 88. Uh, the difference I have with a, a friend of mine that's very, very much into this, and after listening to this time and everybody else, uh, in the scriptures... Uh, let me make two points quickly. First one is uh, that uh, in Second Chronicles uh, uh, 20, when they found all the dead bodies laying, you know, after all they fought and killed each other off, <clears throat> then uh, at the watchtower they noticed, then the uh, Israelites, the saints, went out and gathered all the jewels from, from the dead bodies. So that would represent the uh, judgment time. Now, uh, and... Uh, they went up to Jerusalem singing, going towards Jerusalem, towards heaven, and God put fear on all the other nations in the world, and um, they gave rest with Jehoshaphat, which would be Christ and his people, and gave rest round about. So I consider that to be uh, the time that we're in the judgment, just like in the wilderness, when, uh, <clears throat> when uh, the, uh, uh, they went out you know, through the Red Sea, now they're in the wilderness being tested, and uh, th th there's no more giving the gospel because you don't test during the time uh, of, I mean, you don't sow seed during the time of the judgment. All you're doing is testing the people of God, so to speak, and to see who, want, who really are uh, the jewels, the diamonds, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, so that's why I think the Second Chronicles 20 on the end there represents. I think maybe you agree with that. But could I shift from that and go to Matthew 24? And here's the big key uh, still out on is that in Matthew 24, <clears throat> when it's, or excuse me, yes, Matthew 24. Now bear with me, and I'll, it says in 29, immediately after the uh, tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the power of the heavens shall be revealed. They think, and I'm uh, just throwing this out, that that's actually the beginning of the tribulation, because that's in 88, when, when the moon, the, the, the law of God and the Son of God is darkened, and the, the people mourn, and they see him coming in the clouds there in, in 30, uh, and, and, the, and the angels go and they gather up, and, uh, and all this and that, and the parable, <coughs> and, and, and then they, they go. So they see the earth as the church, representing 
uh, that it, it is on the people. Likewise, he's even at the doors. And, and so if he's at the doors, he's coming. And then heaven shall pass away. Uh, then no man coming. And you should see that. And then well, what they're well, trying to say, well, I know, let me just finish, please. And then I'll, because I'm not, I'm not as succinct as I could be. But the point that they're trying to say is, okay, we have the tribulation from 88 to 94. Then we have the latter rain from 94 on. And the one thing that they're, that they're uh, thinking, because they're trying to err on, uh, on the side of caution, that the latter rain started in 94, and it just continues until the very last day, rather than having uh, 2011 interrupt it, they're just saying it just goes on, because the judgment's always been on the world, the gospel always brings the judgment, but now it's just the latter rain, and it just goes on and on and on uh, to, to, to the uh, end, and, they, and, I, and I'm going, no, no, there's got to be a judgment time when there's actually... Uh, the judgment, like in the wilderness when they were in the sun, you know, for 40 years, and uh, with 1,600 represents 40 times 40, I believe, or, or 40 times 40 times 4 times 4, or whatever. But there's judgment. Uh, I believe that there's a time when, when the Word of God uh, is no more saving, that there is an actual, literal, uh, testing judgment time where there is no more sowing from 94 uh, up to 2011, it ha- and then the judgment happened. But they're saying, oh, no, Chris, is, they're, they're trying to say that, that the gospel's not going out. That's like those in Matthew 25 who, who didn't feed the flock. Cause, oh, no, no, they're, they're feeding the right gospel. But did you follow what I just said, kind yeah. of where they're at? Go yeah, ahead, I, go ahead, Chris. I, I, well, thank you. I, uh, first of all, it says immediately after the tribulation, and they're, oh, okay, so they're saying the tribulation was a 2300 evening morning. What they're doing is they're trying to um, to, sh- to prove that God is still saving. And they're willing to go back and to really make May 21, 2011 of none effect. And when I say that, I mean to make the scriptures that locked in that date of none effect. You know, God's people heard the voice of God through his word. It When May 21, 2011 locked in the way it did, and no one has been able to unlock it, just simply saying, well, May 21 was nothing, that doesn't prove anything. They're, they're, they can't prove it from the Bible. They can't show how is it possible that the 23-year Great Tribulation period ended on that date, and that date was exactly the year, 7,000 years from the flood, and the very um, underlying Hebrew calendar date matched up exactly with the beginning of the flood on the 17th day of the second month. They can't explain that away. They're, They're just trying to talk around it, and they just desperately want salvation to continue and of course we all would we all would want salvation to continue but there comes a point as we read in Luke 16 with the parable of the rich man who's who's in hell and and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom that a great gulf is fixed and it says there that they who who are on the side uh, where Abraham is in Abraham's bosom, they would, that is, it is their desire to come from hence to you with even a drop of water if we could, but they cannot. There is an inability. There is nothing we can do about it. There, there is no way that, that we can go against what God has said in his word. And, and really, it, it's just trying to um, to make Judgment Day go away. The, the Bible speaks of a great tribulation and a great multitude that was saved out of great tribulation. Now, what anyone needs to do, and, and whoever these people are that you're referring to, they need to lay out the, the, the great tribulation according to the Bible and, and lay it out and show when it began, when it will end, 
where we are in relationship to it. And no one is doing that that is critical of uh, May 21, 2011 and being Judgment Day and, and what God did on that day. No one is doing that. All they say is that, well, God's still saving, and, and the reasoning is because believers are still here. Well, it can be clearly shown from the Bible that the presence of believers means nothing concerning salvation. Just read Ezekiel 14, 14 through 20, and, it, and, and that is made abundantly clear. And they do not lay out specifics. They do not say, okay, now the, the church age ended here, the state, and 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 now the great tribulation the judgment on the churches will continue until this day and then comes judgment day they don't do that because they cannot do that the the only thing that fits is the 23 year great tribulation period what do they go for after that do they go for a 70 year great tribulation period no they dare not say it's that long well, uh, is it a 40-year tribulation period? Well, no, no, it, because 40 years from the start doesn't, doesn't fit with anything else. And, and so they just sort of uh, ignore it. They, they don't cover it. They don't discuss it. And, and therefore, none of their conclusions have any merit whatsoever. They have no biblical grounding. They must answer not avoid it. They must specifically answer where we are in relationship to the Great Tribulation. If they can prove from the Bible the Great Tribulation is continuing, all right then, then the latter rain is continuing, and God is saving a great multitude. And and if, if they can't show that, well, and they can't, then then really they, uh, they they're, they're just trying to extend things because they don't like the idea of what God has done. Now, by the way, by the way, concerning sowing seed, you're right. But we're in a time when we're not to sow seed. And, and sowing seed is to share the gospel with the intent and hope and purpose that people hear and become saved. And E-Bible Fellowship is not doing that. But we're in a time of reaping. And it says, for instance, in Psalm 126, I think, Psalm 126, in, um, in verse 5, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There is a time of going forth with seed, and there is a time of, but notice it says, coming again with rejoicing. This is describing the prophesying again that we read about in Revelation chapter 10. Thou must prophesy again. And e-Bible is, is uh, endeavoring, will do the little that we can, as as much as we're able, we are endeavoring to go back to the field in order to be involved in the reaping process, the gathering of those that have already become saved. Now, it's very interesting to me. It's, it's very interesting. Here we are two years and several months, uh, several months past. May 21, 2011, and tell me who is involved in getting the gospel out. And, and right away, you can just dismiss all the churches that they're, they're involved in, in their own kind of gospel activities, which are, are really of no, uh, no value. And you can dismiss all the, the ministries that add or subtract to the Word of God. Who out there of Christians outside the churches and congregations is involved with getting the gospel out. If they believe it's the day of salvation, 
If they believe God is still saving, where are they? Why are they not out there on uh, street corners with tracks? Why have they not planned a mission trip? Why are they not urgently going forth with the gospel? And they are not urgently going forth with the gospel at all. And uh, there, there may be a handful of people out there, but, but it is e-Bible and, and people that are listening to e-Bible that are getting back on the street corners. And e-Bible is going to, Lord willing, plan and, and go on a track trip or two or more before um, the 1,600-day period is up. If, it, if it's God's will, we hope to do this. And uh, the, it, we, we want to obey God. We, if we thought uh, that God was still saving, we would also do track trips for the purpose of sowing. Uh, there's no excuse there is no excuse for people who think God is saving, and yet they are completely inactive. They're more involved in politics and in the, the social problems of America and the world than they are in sowing the seed that they think God is still doing. They, they need to put aside politics and put aside their, uh, their um, campaigns against particular sins and and get out there again and they need to get that gospel out there there's an urgent need if it's true but you see god isn't directing them to do so god isn't using the ministry of family radio to perform that task anymore god is actually working the opposite way when people say that they still want to get the message of salvation out, they are being diminished. They are being less and less. And, and uh, you know, e-Bible has been growing. God has been blessing us as we have gone in this direction. It, it just, it, it doesn't mean we're anything special. It just means we have, by God's grace, aligned ourselves in the proper way. And, you know, I, I remember and have experience with this very same thing back in 2001 when we heard about the end of the church age and we were a church and, and we um, were, were thinking of, of continuing to be a church and there was hardly any uh, impact we were making at all. We had a website, uh, Reformed Bible Church of Delaware, and probably you could count the number of people that visited on, on both your hands. And there was just hardly any outreach whatsoever. And then almost immediately, when, when God finally opened up our eyes to the end of the church age, and when we humbled ourselves as God humbled us to do so, and we disbanded and, and we no longer were a church, and we changed the website from a church website to just a Christian ministry website, and it, it became eBible Fellowship. Almost immediately, overnight, we started getting hundreds and hundreds of requests for Bibles. that uh, They just kept pouring in, and, and they never really stopped over the long period from 2001 up until 2011. And many other things happened blessing after blessing after blessing. It seemed that everything we were involved in prospered spiritually. There was just complete, uh, um, uh, there was turnaround and, and wonderful blessing. Why? Because we aligned ourselves in the right direction. We were not going against the grain, not going against the will of God any longer, but now, we were going with the will of God. And likewise, that's how it is concerning May 21, 2011, Judgment Day. I, I have yet to see one individual prosper who has gone in that direction. I have yet to see a ministry prosper. I have yet to see 
um, it, any benefit whatsoever. I don't see any Bible studies of people that have gone in that direction that are uh, really finding truth and uncovering what God has done. There, it, there's nothing, nothing but the opposite. There, there is a diminishing, a lessening. Uh, there, there is a removal of the blessing of God when people go that way. When they deny May 21, not long, they're denying other things, and they lose sight of truth, and they are left in confusion or in outright holding to lies. And, and uh, you know, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that is exactly the situation. And people um, are, are, each one of us are faced with this very question, which way are we going to go? It's been over two years, approaching two and a half years, and the time for confusion, all right, there was a time for that. But God has clarified a great many things, and now individuals are just giving evidence they're not hearkening. They're not listening or obeying the word of God, and they're doing so, uh, I'm sorry to say, in many cases, for the very same reason the people in the churches did not hearken and obey the word of God concerning the judgment upon them because they have no spiritual ears to hear, because they, they do not see or understand what God is doing at this time. But thank you for your okay. comments and, and for bringing up thank those you, verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good afternoon, Chris. A blessed Lord's Day to you and all who are listening. Thank you for taking my question. My question is, in light of the verses that we looked at today regarding the ignorance of the people, could you read Acts 17, verses 30 to 31, and it relates to our day? Acts 17, in verse 30. Oh, yes, th th this is a good passage to tie in. And uh, Acts 17, 30, in the times of this ignorance, well, let me back up um, in verse 28, for in him, we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men that in that he has raised him from the dead. And yes, God um, likens the, the rebellion of many people to ignorance. They, they worshiped idols or perhaps they just worshiped another in another religion, and that's an idol. And, and God um, is, is still bringing the gospel to them in the day of salvation. And, and he's saying, no, uh, God winked at that because it was done in ignorance. But now, now is the command to repent. And, and this would apply to um, the proclamation in the days leading up to judgment day especially as as it refers here to an appointed day that and god uh, called all the people of the earth he he sent forth his word and called everyone finally to the marriage supper of the lamb and um it, it, it didn't matter if they were involved in idolatry all right now now there's a possibility you might find mercy because you did those things ignorantly in unbelief, and and now perhaps God will have mercy upon you. But during that time, during that period, God was making this call to the, the nations of the world and their inhabitants. It was those in the churches that were saying, don't listen to this. 
uh, no man knows a day or hour. And, and as God is calling these people, individuals, leaders in the churches are, uh, are fighting against it <clears throat> out of willful disobedience. And I think we can see the, the difference between the two. But thank you uh, for those verses. And I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and your comments this afternoon. We, we've come to the end of our time today, and uh, we're going to return to our Sunday um, online fellowship uh, with some more scripture reading and, and hymns in just a minute. I'd like also to invite everyone to visit um, our Sunday uh, open question and answer group tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time until 11 p.m. Eastern Time. It's, it's now two hours, um, and it's a text uh, question and answer time on Facebook, the Sunday open Q&A group on Facebook. You can just, if you're on Facebook, type that in the search box it should it should uh, bring it up and all are welcome and also lord willing tomorrow night at 9 30 p.m again eastern standard time we'll have another live audio question and answer uh following the bible study at 9 30 p.m on monday but for now have a good afternoon and may the lord's perfect will be done and thank you for joining us here on eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time. You can hear this broadcast each and every Sunday around 1 o'clock Eastern. And don't forget, you can also join us for yet another live questions and answers time Friday evenings at about 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a pleasant Sunday afternoon and may the Lord's perfect will be done.